Okay, so we'll come back. We continue where we left. We had looked at all these process solutions and now let's get back to the questions that we had asked <coughs> and see if we can answer them. What poses the Somali current? Local longshore winds, we have seen that. It is in the longshore wind solution that the Somali current was strongest. But Raspi waste forced by equipment pumping is important for offshore gyres because those gyres uh, cannot be produced just by the Somali current itself. There's also a big impact of uh, loss B waves coming in from the <laughs> equator and the Arabian Sea. They have an impact on the Somali current. And uh, one thing to note is that this is one current system for which the nonlinearity cannot be known because there are two gyres set up in the north that's the Great Wall and uh, the Socotra ID. These two uh, coalesce into a single anticyclonic gyre if you have a linear system. And this is one of perhaps only it's perhaps the only major feature of the North Indian Ocean circulation that you really cannot reproduce with a linear system. What forces the Witke jets at the equator? Wind bursts that occur as the tropical convergence zone crosses the equator. So you have a Yoshida jet, but it's a bounded Yoshida jet because the wind stress occurs over a patch along the equator. It's uh, westerly winds, eastward winds at the equator, tau x is greater than zero, but it is a burst that is restricted in both time and space. The restriction in space implies that you have equatorial Kelvin and Rossby waves that uh, kill the jet and um, the wind uh, itself breaks down. We have always looked at the Yoshita jet and similar systems with a single step function. But here we have the step function, the wind sets up and then the wind breaks down too. So there is uh, another step down, apart from the equatorial Kelvin and Ross periods. Why is the EICC, the East India Coastal Current, weaker during the summer monsoon than during March-April? During March-April, the ICC is a western boundary current of a seasonal subtropical jar forced by equipment pumping. This <coughs> is uh, shown using a steady state solution in uh, Shetty et al. 1993. But if you want to look at a uh, time dependent solution which is uh, more authentic, then you have to look at uh, Shankar et al. 96 and McCree et al. 96. The first is analytic and the second is numeric. In fact, these two papers were a consequence of a review comment on the Shetty et al. 93 paper in GGR. Uh, the question was regarding the sweat solution. And the reviewer said, he really doesn't think it applies because you have a strong time dependence as you state in the introduction. So a steady state solution is not really viable. That's why we look at the only one and that's what we got. Sorry, I uh, looked at an unsteady solution and uh, uh, the, led to those two papers. The second thing is that during the summer monsoon, the locally forced East India coastal current is strong and it is forward in the direction of the wind. But the remotely forced uh, EICC is forced by both equatorial winds, that's uh, in April, May, and then the Rossby and Kelly Mayer system. The Kelly Mayer is carrying the uh, signal, which is now an equator wide current at the bay, its western boundary, to the east coast of India. Uh, that and Eggman pumping over the Bay of Bengal that triggers Rossby waves that reflect off the east coast of India. Both of them produce uh, an equator body seen the coastal current that occurs in the full body ICC, weakening it and also weakening the pillow. That's why you will find that um, the winds are weak in March April, but uh, the ICC is strong because the equipment pumping is strong and the winds are weak. Winds are strong locally off the east coast of India in July, but the ICC is weak. Why does the WICC, the West India Coastal Current, reverse with season when the local longshore winds are unidirectional? 
national license and uh, WICC being forced more by killing their generator along the Indian East Coast. We've seen that in this uh, process solutions. Now, if you look at an earlier paper, if I'm not mistaken, it is uh, Shetty et al. 1991, or Shetty et al. 1990. This is the Western boundary current of the uh, boundary current of the west coast of India during the winter monsoon. They tried explaining why the current flows into the wind. And the explanation they invoked is the lower salinity on the southern end of uh, southwest India. There's a strong salinity gradient up the west coast of India. The salinity increases markedly as you go north. And uh, this they showed leads to a pressure gradient which can over the uh, observed equator world wind. And uh, this is the explanation given in that paper. But if you look at um, a model like McCreary et al. 93, or the one we used, Shetty and I, in 1997, uh, neither of them has a in it. The McCreary, Kundu, and Mulnari paper of 93 is, uh, has temperature. There's an equation for conservation of heat, but there's no salt in it. It produces the reversal in the current. So salinity gradient cannot be the cause. Likewise, in our paper, we didn't even have temperature variations. It's a purely dynamical model. The upper layer temperature is constant. It doesn't change in time or space. And uh, same was true of the salinity. But you still need a longshore pressure gradient. And what produces this longshore pres pressure gradient is the Kellen wave generated along the Indian East Coast. It propagates down south as a downwelling Kellen wave. So sea level is high because the longshore wind is uh, equatable when the monsoon collapses in uh, October. So the Kellen wave is downwelling favorable because the longshore wind has um, is equatorward and pushes the Ekman flow towards the coast. The downwelling Kellen wave comes down to the southern tip of Sri Lanka and that higher pressure triggered by the Kellen wave there is higher than the pressure that you see off the uh, coast of Pakistan. So you still have a longshore pressure gradient, but now it has been set up by the Kellen wave. And that Kellen wave turns around and goes up the west coast of India, and because it also radiates off as a Cosby wave. Why is filling stronger of the Indian west coast than of the Indian east coast? Forcing from the equator and bike wind pumping weaken the East India coastal current during the summer monsoon. These processes interfere destructively. The local forcing by the winds, which produce stronger pain, and the equipment pumping, which produces Rossby waves that propagate westward across the bay, and the equatorial forcing. Both of them produce a downwelling favorable uh, PICC. And uh, they interfere destructively to weaken a pain. The low salinity surface layer may also play a role. We do not know for sure. This is something that uh, has to be shown after taking dynamics into account. And it's probably going to require very careful simulations with either uh, multi-layer reduced gravity models or a GC with very carefully constructed experiments. What forces the monsoon currents? Unfortunately, the answer is several processes, all acting in concert, forcing different parts of these transbasin currents. We saw that the first part of the monsoon current that sets up some monsoon current is the one in the Bay of Bengal which is actually the head of the current. The tail of the current in the Arabian Sea starts later. So these are all independent currents that are being forced by the Rossby wave uh, propagation. And the monsoon currents are essentially the front of the Rossby wave in the Bay of Bengal. Similarly, the winter monsoon current that uh, uh, bends around the Lakshadweep high. And as the high propagates towards Somalia, the current uh, lengthens towards the uh, western boundary of the Arabian Sea. And then from there, it will come back along the northern flank of that high, uh, practically towards the Indian coast. So, uh, shown to be important. Then you have Rossby waves triggered by equatorial events, Rossby waves triggered by equipment pumping. All of them together act in concert and they force different parts of these transpacing currents. Each of them arises at a certain time and decays at a certain time. Therefore, you have, it's like a, an orchestra, practically, with different instruments playing at different times. And these monsoon currents, uh, in the mature phase, which is only in July and in January, they occur in the 
full blown trans bass and fave. It's like one of those crescendos in orchestra when all instruments go on at the same time. Otherwise, you see pieces here and there. And you can see one of them existing while the other is forming. And it's only when both are in their mature phase that the other current does not exist. So, this is more complex, and I don't want to go into the details, but you can look at uh, paper by Shankar et al. 2002. Okay, I have looked at this before, but we'll go over it quickly. What is the simplest model for the southwest coast of India for explaining the Lakshadweep high and low? Yes, sir. It should be, yes. The question is, upwelling should be strong during March, April along the east coast of India. Yes. And you have a strong uh, poleward boundary current, and it's one time when the bay looks somewhat. Mm, it's a very guarded statement. Don't take it literally. It's somewhat like the Atlantic or the Pacific, with that boundary current being the equivalent to the Gulf Stream. But you must remember you have a very strongly time dependent system here. Okay, what forces the luxury high and low? Now, the model that we constructed, in fact, I started my work here in NIO with uh, trying to explain this. And the provocation for that were the first pictures of multimeter data that were seen by any of us here. Shetty had gone to Bordeaux in France and had come back with 12 transparencies. I don't know how many of you have seen transparencies. 12 pictures, global altimeter signals, one for each month. That's the best that could be done in those days. And uh, what was striking in those pictures is those sea level features is going off the southwest coast of India. And we wanted to know why that is happening. Uh, we realized at that time that uh, uh, it had been at least partially explained in McCreary et al. 93, but it was not complete. The other question that was puzzling is from hydrographic data. Now, if you do a hydrographic cruise in March, April, when the high has radiated well offshore of uh, southwest India, the section is not going to reach the end of that uh, front. It's not going to reach that possibly a front of southwest India. So your section covers part of that regime. And when you look at these sections uh, going cross shore of the west coast, there was a strange thing that was seen in the data. Of southwest India, the current was towards the equator, but north of about 13 north, that is of Mangalore, the current was polar all along the rest of the west coast. So why was this happening? This were the two problems that we were trying to explain, and like all good uh, films, they turned out to have the same explanation. So two problems were being attacked at the same time, and uh, turned out that uh, the explanation lay in what uh, we showed later. But uh, we didn't start off with this kind of an approach. We actually tried solving analytically the equations for the killing wave propagating along the parabolic coastline, which is a pretty decent uh, mathematical approximation of the coast of India. If you use a parabolic coastline, then you have to use what's called a parabolic coordinate system. And it was a nightmare. Even on the F plane, which is what I use, it's, uh, it was terrible because the coordinates were square roots. And when you see something going offshore, it really doesn't imply that anything is going offshore. It is just that the coordinate has become a square root, so things stretch and stretch differently. When you are at low wise, the stretch is more, so you see it looks like that front has propagated more. When you go farther north, the stretch is less, so it looks like it has propagated less. Even the F-plane solution was a nightmare. But uh, the, we knew that we would have to apply it on an equal beta plane, and it didn't look like we were going to get anywhere with it, at least a beta plane solution. And it didn't look like we were going to get anywhere with it. So after six months, I dumped it. And the question was, what do you do now? So the way we approached it was uh, to turn the problem around. We said, OK, let's see what we want to explain. We had this Kellen wave coming down the East Coast. The initial idea was to get that Kellen wave coming down. As it turns around, we see what happens. We expect the high to radiate offshore and the low in the other half of the year. But uh, we couldn't produce that Kellen wave along the East Coast of India. But we said, suppose we were to align the West Coast meridionally. It doesn't really matter much. 
you do that. Now, if uh, we assume the East Coast Kelvin rate, which is not a problem because we assume that anyway it's coming down. Now, what happens when it turns around the coast at the southern tip? That is what we were looking at. So, I said, okay, suppose we were to look at the data. These are data from uh, Shot et al. 1994. Here's the transport of the monsoon current south of Sri Lanka. And you can see that if you were to look at the seasonal cycle, it is eastward, that's the summer monsoon current, and westward for the winter monsoon current. So in principle, I can look at this as an oscillating current, uh, an oscillating zonal current, east-west current, south of uh, the southern tip of Sri Lanka, which lies at 6 north. So suppose I assume a meridional coast. I prescribe only this oscillating current. The model is now set up on an equatorial beta plane. We are solving analytically, paper and pen. Will we get the high and low? This is the question. This is the boundary condition. Of course, there is no boundary here. Nor is there any boundary here. There is no cost. You know that in an analytic solution, the cost is mathematical. I have to, by some means, ensure that u goes to zero at this uh, latitudes and here. And the u field is restricted to within a small distance of the peak that is at uh, 5 north. Um, it turned out we had to add 7500 uh, meridional modes. And when we added 7,500 meridional modes, this is the accuracy to which we could satisfy the boundary condition. We needed these many meridional modes to satisfy the boundary condition. You can see these wiggles. It basically means that there are so many modes that the U is alternately plus and minus, plus and minus, plus and minus. And the same thing happens south of that peak of the current. And uh, at the equator, you have, again, as good as a zero current as you do out here. So we added 7,500 meridional bonds. It was a program written with uh, Fortran code with complex uh, variables. And now we have added these up. This is the boundary condition. The question is, what will you see when you calculate offshore? Will you see the high and the low? That's the only question. And the answer is yes, you do. When uh, everything had been done, the code had to be run. It used to take about a couple of hours or more for this code to run. Should you ask me, dekhai I said, hona chahi. Otherwise, the total beta plane is meaningless. It doesn't hold. And after some time, next day, it used to take time in those days. Today, you will do it in a few seconds. But in those days, we used to take time. We were slow. This is the high and the low. This is one half of the annual cycle. We timed that current to peak uh, during uh, January, which is when the winter monsoon current peaks. You can see that. But it starts around October. And you can see this. This is the Kelling wave going up the coast, the Rossby wave radiating offshore. Strictly speaking, right through you will have a Rossby wave going off because you are within the critical latitude. And uh, it shows you a high. This is at a 360-day period. At a 60-day period, the critical latitude, as we saw yesterday, comes down to 10 north. This is that solution. Alternate highs and lows. Now smaller, but there's trapping north of 10 north. It's coastally trapped Kelling wave. But if you recall, the boundary condition is not satisfied completely. It's not identically zero. There is a minuscule error associated with it. And that error is what you see out here as a Rossby wave, which is something we got even in the numerical solutions. When we go to a 30-day period, the critical latitude goes to about 3 north, which means that uh, the southern tip of Sri Lanka, the entire current field, is north of the critical latitude. So you have only a coastally tracked Again, 7,500 meridional modes have been added. 7,500 hermit functions have been added to produce this. The only waves that can exist are westward propagating waves and westward decaying waves. Nothing else can exist. You can't have eastward propagating waves because uh, the only wave that goes eastward is the killing wave. And uh, that is trapped within about 3 degrees of the equator. We are not interested in the NI wave for the same reason. So all we are left with is westward propagating Rossby waves. So modes L equals 1 to 7500 were added to produce the solution.
most of them are uh, trapped or decaying modes. Only a few of them will propagate offshore. Many will, of course, for the annual cycle. And that's why you see so much of radiation. Which dash line? This line. This line just indicates that the current is nearly zero out here, south of this latitude. This is a Gaussian function, a sharp Gaussian function. You see power minus y minus 5 degrees with some narrow band length scale. And the function we chose were of two kinds. One is a Gaussian and the other is an exponential function. So that function would decay this way. It would be a maximum right at the post, which is typically how you would have it in a system which uh, doesn't have a post. But uh, unfortunately, that uh, solution, though I could calculate, though I could uh, get the analytic expression for it in the integral form, it could not be evaluated on the computer in those days. I still remember the function. It's a complex hypergeometric function of the third kind. Even in Mathematica, there were no, there was no way of evaluating it. But today, I think you can do all that. It was chosen to be a Gaussian, and it was chosen to be a Gaussian because for the Gaussian function, the function that resulted was simpler, and I could evaluate it on the computer. In those days, the first workstation had been bought in NIO, and it was possible to get some time on it and run this uh, program. But anyway, this is the simplest model that explains the high and the low. And this is something that is intrinsic to science. It's not enough to be able to make a prediction. Unless you understand why you are right, or if you are wrong, why you are wrong, you are in trouble. Otherwise, uh, for example, if you invest in the stock market, if you are lucky, you win. It's like playing a lottery. But if you know how the whole system is fixed, then you are going to win every time. And that's what Shakuni did in the Mahabharata. And that's what uh, is done in the casino. They put, uh, when it's based on uh, game theory, they make sure that your winning chances are fixed on average at some point. And uh, you, on average, you cannot win beyond that. Average in the sense of all customers put together. Uh, so the casino is always going to make money, make its money. Otherwise, it can't exist. And some of you will make money, some of you will lose money. So those who win keep coming back, those who lose also keep coming back in the hope that they will win sometime. But the game is very well fixed. And um, if you know how to fix the game, you're going to win much more. But uh, here your interest is more serious. It's like investing in the stock market. If you know what is going on and why it is so, you have a better chance. But if uh, you invest only to win, you don't stand a post of a chance. Likewise here, it's not enough to be able to make the simulation, make an accurate simulation. You need to understand why it is right. Because tomorrow, if the simulation is not right, you need to know why you went wrong. That is the reason for all this analysis. And it turns out, when uh, you show GCM simulations to a person like Julian McCreary, with his remarkable experience with all these solutions, he can tell much more than the most uh, proficient of these GCM models, most of the time. He can see things that uh, they can't uh, do. Anyway, so what were the basic processes that uh, we looked at and have invoked? One is the tendency to reach sweat root balance. I put it at the top because it's the most remarkable feature. The ocean is always trying to reach sweat root balance, whatever it be. And everything is a process towards that. It's learning towards that. If um, the sweater balance is a coastal one, it could be coastal Kelvin waves. If there is a beta plane, then it could be Rossby waves. It will be Rossby waves and leaving the sweater balance behind it. It's always aiming to reach sweater balance. We saw that even in the equatorial system. It's tending to reach the sweater balance. It radiates gravity waves, it radiates uh, Rossby and Kelvin waves, it radiates NI waves and uh, the inertial oscillations too. There's Ekman flow. We see this pretty strongly in many GCM solutions, in particular very close to the surface, in the surface bins. 
we have Yoshida jet at the equator and the coastal jets along the medial boundary. <coughs> One of the major waves we have invoked is the equatorial killing wave. It propagates eastward along the equator. It has a speed of about 2 meters per second and it's trapped within about 3 degrees of the equator. There is the equatorial Rossby wave, propagates westward along the equator. Its speed at the equator is one third that of the equatorial Killing wave, and its speed is proportional to 1 by y squared. That is why you get that classic shape of the Rossby wave, propagating much faster, closer to the equator, and slower as you go away. Then there is the coastal Killing wave, so coastally trapped, propagates along the coast, with the coast on the right in the northern hemisphere. Now remember one thing, it's the direction of propagation of the wave is always the same. It's always going to go with the coast on its right in the northern hemisphere. But the direction of the current associated with it can be in either direction. Because it can be an upwelling Kelvin wave, it can be a downwelling Kelvin wave. This has to be noted. Its speed is the same as that of the equatorial Kelvin wave because it's determined purely by stratification. In the one and a half layer reducibility model, it's uh, square root of g prime h or g prime h bar in a linear system. It radiates Rossby waves when propagating poleward along the eastern boundary. We also saw the Yanai wave. The reason for putting it in italics here is because it is not important for the seasonal cycle. It is an important feature of the equatorial circulation at interseasonal periods, but it's not important for the seasonal cycle. Now, if you were to look at one thing here, the coastal killing wave is coastally trapped. And if you look at the southern tip of Sri Lanka, it's uh, located at 6 north. If you calculate C by F at 6 north for the first baroclinic mode, you get about 2 degrees. If you calculate the equatorial Rossby radius of deformation, it's about 3 degrees. So if you were to add both of them, you still get a value that is less than the latitude of the southern tip of Sri Lanka. <coughs> Which means that if you have a coastal killing wave going along the southern tip, around the bending around the southern tip from the east coast to the west coast of India, it will not interfere with the equatorial Kelvin wave. The two are separated by a patch that falls in neither wave guide. It's uh, there, but it's exponentially decaying and they don't really interfere. <coughs> Which means that you can get a strong semi-annual signal at the equator and the signal can become annual at the southern tip of Sri Lanka, which is exactly what you see here. If you look at uh, eighty east, 79 east, which is basically the southern tip of Sri Lanka, if you look at the South Indian Ocean, 12 south, this is the South Equatorial Current. This is basically the equatorial and monsoon current systems. Uh, so we have uh, zonal current here plotted as a function of latitude and time at different longitudes. Okay, And what you have is a color scale. Blue means westward, red means eastward. If you look at 79 east, when you come to the equator, you get two bursts of eastward uh, current, that's the Whitkey jet, and you get weak westward flows in between. So it's a semi-annual uh, cyclicity. While if you go farther north to the into the bay at uh, north of 6 north, bay out here, oh, sorry, um, the, sorry, this is the southern tip of Sri Lanka at about 7 north out here, 6 north, 7 north. What do you find is that uh, it's an annual cycle, the single reversal. This would not be possible if the southern tip of Sri Lanka were much farther south. If it was at say 3 north, you would see an interference of the two waveguides and then the passage of the coastal Kelvin wave up the west coast of India would no longer be a viable one. So the solution would be quite different. Okay, and that separation is what is shown out here. The red color shows you the coastal waveguide, the blue color shows you the equatorial waveguide. And neither waveguide as we have seen is uh, capable of retaining the energy within it. The equatorial waveguide leaks energy poleward along the eastern boundary because of those coastal killing waves. When the east coastal killing wave reflects at the eastern boundary. Likewise, the coastal killing waves when they reach the equator, they go into the equatorial waveguide. But these coastal killing waves at the seasonal cycle, they are, and these are uh, 
uh, real wave numbers. So it's strictly not a coastal Kelvin wave in the sense of Dennis Moore. What you have here is Rossby wave with uh, radiating offshore, but its speed is much greater out here. And that's what is shown here, long arrows towards the south and small arrows towards the north. So you see radiation offshore being much faster in the south than in the north. So the coastal waveguide also leaks energy out into the interior of the basin in both the Bay and the Arabian Sea. Plus there is Ekman pumping shown by these circles out here. That radiates Rossby waves again westward. So you basically have a leaky waveguide. And what is marked out here are the critical latitudes for the semi-annual cycle that's almost at the northern boundary of the bay. But there is a patch of the Arabian Sea in the north that is beyond that. Then there's the 60-day critical latitude that's about 10 north, or maybe a little south of that. Then the 30-day one, which is south of this equatorial, I mean the coastal bay guide of Sri Lanka. That's why the 30-day um, analytic solution showed only a trapped coastal killing wave. It could not radiate it best, radiate best for us across the region. At 60 days, there is some radiation that's possible. <clears throat> An implication that's immediate is that the existence of this leaky wave guide merges the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and the Equatorial Ocean into a single dynamical entity, which must be modeled as a whole even to simulate the seasonal circulation in its parts. If I want to look at even the seasonal cycle of the current of Goa, there is no way I can do it with a limited domain model, a model restricted to the coast of Goa, or even the Arabian Sea. There is a paper by Kundu and uh, McLean and Kundu in 1988. It's a similar model but restricted to the Raven Sea. One and a half layer model with an embedded mix layer. It's rarely cited. The two and a half layer model is the one that is much more cited because that gets you the circulation right. The one and a half layer model doesn't get it right, but it's not so because it's a one and a half layer model. It's because of the domain. It's restriction to the Raven Sea. Now the fossil from the equator and from the Bay of Bengal is available. <clears throat> this is implications if you want to run a forecasting system at very high resolutions. The problem is that you can't run at very high resolutions for the entire basin because then your computational requirement explodes. You double the resolution, that is half the grid size. The rule of thumb is, and just so horizontal, we are still not talking about the vertical. The rule of thumb is that it will go as 2 power 3, the number of time steps. Because your time step will reduce by a factor of 2 and uh, a factor of uh, 8 because it is 2 into 2 into 2, that's how you get it. So it's n cubed. If you were to reduce the, increase the resolution by a factor of 5, it would be 5 cubed. So it's not cheap to increase the resolution. And uh, very often you will find that forecasting models are run in what's called a nested form very high resolution in the region of interest, say the west coast of India, and the coastal resolution outside it. Question is whether that's viable at all or not. The coastal model will, for reasons I won't bother to go into now, uh, get weak occurrence. And uh, if it does so, how good is the fine resolution model if it is forced by poor boundary conditions? But these are still open questions to which we don't have answers in this region. But as I'll show you in the next part, we have been talking of only the circulation on the slope and offshore. We have not dealt with anything on the shelf yet. But there is one paper I will mention that will show you that a lot of what we are talking of is important even within water depths as shallow as 10 meters of the coast of Goa. And 10 meters of the coast of Goa is not very far offshore. It is typically the kind of depth range in which you carry out current meter measurements for environmental impact assessment studies. And it turns out that if I want to look at the variability of the longshore current of Goa, even at that water column, 10 meters, I need to go at least to the southern tip of India, probably more, as someone's paper in 2012 last year suggests. So we don't know how far back along the coast. We are tracking backward along the coast. How far back we have to go? We are not sure of that yet. Which means that even if I were to, uh, if my interest is restricted to looking at the impact of an effluent pipeline 
of say Miramar or Kalamwood Beach and so on, it's not enough to model just the small region of Goa because the circulation is not isolated. So what we have been talking of has uh, implications even for the shelf region. Again, let's move on. The long march. Yeah. Hmm? Doesn't cancel out completely. Equipment pumping and the equatorial forcing, two of them. They don't cancel out the long shot when the, okay. they weaken the eastern yes. Which one? Yeah. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you're mistaken. The equipment pumping is an independent process. The equatorial forcing, the Rossby and Kelling waves associated with, is an independent forcing. The Kelling wave generated by the longshore winds of the east coast of India, independent forcing. The Kelling wave generated by the longshore winds come down, comes down south along the east coast and propagates poleward along the west coast to produce a strong response along the west coast. Of the east coast of India, it produces a strong response. It doesn't produce a weak response. It is the longshore wind that produces a pretty strong response. Strong appelling and which one? But there is equipment pumping which has started earlier. That produces uh, that cyclonic in that season. And the basin is small, so it doesn't take very long for the Rossby wave to go across, at least from the western region of the Bay of Bengal. So what you end up with is uh, a situation where the Equipment pumping produces a produces an equator word flow at the coast. Likewise, the Kelling wave associated with the Vitki jet it's gone around and it produces a, produces an equator word flow. And both of them act to counteract the poleward flow alone associated with the East India Coastal Current, caused by the longshore winds. So they weaken the filling. They weaken the filling and they weaken the current. Kelvin wave generator is going to remain. I mean, these are independent processes in the linear system. Yeah, they just superpose. So you have to superpose on the west coast of India separately to see the response. How strong is the equatorial system as it comes down? It will weaken partly because it will bend. The longer it has to go, the more it will bend because you have vertical modes. And if you have vertical modes, uh, the energy goes down, your phase goes up. So the longer that equatorial signal has to propagate, the more it will bend down. <laughs> okay, this is a long march. Uh, very brief history of this long march. The first part is around the world. So what's the basic uh, the history of the basic theory? The first paper is by Taro Matsuno, 1966. He described the track waves on an equatorial beta prime. Then a small PhD thesis, 1960. This is remarkable. 66, 68, 69. Again, it's reminiscent of the post World War II five year period when Swedrup, Stommel, and Mann, 46, 48, and 50 explain the um, mid-latitude gyres and the western boundary currents. More 1968 explained the reflection of the equatorial Kelling waves at an eastern ocean boundary. He showed how to reflect an equatorial Kelling wave at an eastern ocean boundary. Lytle in 1969, James Lytle, he realized that there is a faster propagation near the equator. The waves propagate much faster near the equator. And therefore, the Somali current would respond very rapidly to the changing monsoon winds. It's basically the idea of the curl of wind stress in the ocean produces the Rossby wave. We know that the Rossby wave speed is small as you go farther away from the equator. And uh, Lytle said, when you come close to the equator, it's pretty fast. So, well within the season, in fact, within a month, you can trigger. Equatorial Rossby waves that will reflect off the coast of Somalia and produce the required uh, forward current. 
Lightly was right about that, but he was wrong about one thing. He invoked the curl of wind stress at the equator. It was later shown that at the equator you don't need the curl. The vanishing F at the equator implies that you will have a strong response coming from just zonal winds at the equator, which is what we have seen. You have a bounded Yoshida jet, you generate the Ross B wave going away from it, and it produces its own response when it reflects out of western bound. You will have to use that chain rule going down towards lower hills. That's how you would do it. But these three papers set up the basic theory. Everything else is an application. Reflection at an eastern boundary, observations. It was first done in the Pacific. There are two papers, Enfield and Allen, 1980, and Shelton and Davis, 1982. I'm not sure which one this is from, but basically what they showed is uh, if you take uh, the sea level along the coast of the North American West Coast, then you can track the sea level. This is the poleward movement of the sea level field. And the speed is reasonably good to match the uh, Kelvin wave. So, sea level height lags El Nino index. El Nino index being computed for the equator. It's the equatorial Kelvin wave produced thanks to the El Nino reflecting at the eastern boundary, which is the coast of Peru, producing a coastal Kelvin wave. And that coastal Kelvin wave is what they track. This was done in these two papers, 1918-1982. Curiously, the theory had come earlier, 1976, two papers, one by Julian McCready and the other by Herbert et al. I'm not sure of the uh, second author in this paper, but I think the third author is Jim O'Brien, J.J. O'Brien, who was in Florida State University. And um, this is a similar, I'll come back to these two chaps, McCreary and Hulbert. This is a figure from McCreary's 1976 paper. I think it's taken from some other paper of his, which showed it better. It was much cleaner in the other paper. <coughs> what it shows you is the response to a patch of winds out here, similar to the kind of analytic solutions we have been looking at. You see the equal Kellen wave, you see the Rossby wave, reflection out here, the reflection out here, and the reflected Rossby wave coming back. So, McCready tended to solve these uh, systems analytically, and Jim O'Brien and his students, Harley Hulbert was one student, there was John Kindle, there was uh, J. Dana Thompson and some others, Mark Luther and others, they were using a uh, deduced gravity kind of system uh, and solving it numerically with uh, some kind of observed wind stresses. These two groups, McCreary by himself and with maybe isolated collaborators, they vary from basin to basin. Uh, and Jim O'Brien and his students, they first applied these ideas to the Pacific in the 1970s. Mind you, the observations came in 1980s. The theory precedes the observations. They made the prediction that you should see this, propagation of sea level. And observations a few years later actually showed that that is true. So there's a chronology of ideas specific in the 1970s, and the same chaps moved to the Atlantic in the 1980s, and they come to the Indian Ocean in the 1990s. By then, the students have changed. Uh, it's Jim Potemra and uh, Lee San Yu for Jim O'Brien, and McCready has Kundu and Kundu as his, uh, Pijush Kundu as his collaborator. There's a close link between observations and theory, but not any observations, systematic observations. What we have here are tide gauge observations that are routinely collected. And uh, this is a systematic set of observations that are carried out for a very different purpose, but they show you a signal that is related to Elino. So if you carry out a set of systematic observations, you can test theories. If you carry out haphazard observations, you really cannot test theories. So if you want to go out to sea and make some observations, it pays to have some idea in place. And you design uh, crews, either experimental or observations, to test the idea. And you must get a yes or no kind of answer. The Indian Ocean story begins with the International Indian Ocean Expedition in the 1960s. 
I think in 2015 or 2016 we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary. The first great paper was Lytle 1969, rapid response to the Somali current to the onset of the summer monsoon. An amazing follow-up was by Michael Cox in 1970. This is an OG same simulation of the Somali current. The model that we use today called the Model Roshan model uh, was originally started by Kirk Bryan and his collaborator Michael Cox in the late 60s, mid to late 60s. This was incredible. In those days, they were running these experiments on computers that uh, were slower than the probably the mobiles that we have today. Uh, probably just about as good if you were looking at the main frames. So you were looking at maybe not even comparable to PC today, but uh, they could do some things. So Michael Cox ran the first OG Sim simulation of Somali current. These were remarkable things. I guess they were better than the mobiles, but they weren't much better than the PCs of today. Um, so this comes just a year after Lytle's uh, landmark paper. There's been considerable work on the equatorial Indian Ocean. The highlight earlier was the Somali current. The focus shifted to the equatorial Indian Ocean because the people wanted to know if you would see an undercurrent at the equator in the Indian Ocean too. And you don't find it. Uh, the observation of the equatorial jet, it was by Klaus Wittke in 1973. It's now named after him. It's called the Wittke jet. Then the theory for the equatorial jet followed by, followed in 1974, Jim O'Brien and Hadley Hulbert. The West India Coastal Current. Uh, Carl Bansi in 1959 was the first to point out the existence of an undercurrent along the west coast of India from hydrographic observations. In hydrographic data, it's not easy to pin down an undercurrent. You must have uh, some confidence in your data to judge an undercurrent because the isotherms don't move up as much. And uh, the other problem is there are things called internal tides. And when you run a section, you have a time difference between any two stations. If that time difference is equal or comparable to the half the period of the semi dynamic tide, which is the major tide out here, they won't have a problem because the isotherm shifts can be as large as 10 to 20 meters in uh, the thermal line, courtesy of the internal tides. And it's very difficult to catch undercurrents because of this problem in the hydrographic data. Bansi pointed that out. Sharma in 1968, G.S. Sharma in 1968, this is a paper I really enjoyed reading, and Karl Bansi again in 1968, said that upwelling is stronger in the south and remarkable. They said that it seems to propagate from south to north. Given the kind of data that they have, this is a remarkable statement to make. It requires a lot of uh, careful analysis to bring this out. And these were careful people. They also commented on the flow going against the wind. Bansi in 1959 said that prevailing winds are comparable during winter. It's comparing to the other basins. You have northeasterly winds in the North Indian Ocean, southeasterly trades in the southern part, southern hemisphere. So these are comparable to what you see in the Pacific and Atlantic during winter. But the boundary current of Somalia is equatorial. So this Mansi says that prevailing winds are comparable during winter, but the circulation is comparable during summer. That is when the Somali current flows poleward, like the Gulf Stream and the Kurosio and the other boundary currents. Shetty and Chennai, 1988, they said that the West India coastal current is comparable to other eastern boundary systems only during the summer monsoon. Along traditional eastern boundaries, you have equatorward winds which means you have upwelling, coastal upwelling. And you will see um, an equator but current associated with that, which you see only during the summer monsoon of the west coast of India. During winter, it's uh, flowing into the wind. So it's not like a traditional eastern boundary system. There were systematic hydrographic observations in the Indian East then, during the late 80s and early 90s described in a set of five remarkable papers by Shetty and his colleagues. They make possible a theoretical treatment of the West India Coastal Current. Because unless you have systematic observations, 
you don't get systematic patterns that can be trusted. Now, if you have these kind of observations, you can actually come up with ideas that can be tested with models, whether analytic or numerical, it does not matter. Whether it's simple models or GCMs, it does not matter. But then you can run simulations to test them. Just as Lytle wanted to explain why the Somali current sets in so quickly after the summer monsoon sets in. And that is a theory, 1969. Polward WICC during winter is driven by long shore salinity and therefore density and pressure gradient. This is what Shetty et al. 1991 said. Okay, so the paper is 1991. They likened it to the Lubin current of the west coast of Australia. This is a paper by McCready Kundu and Shetty in 1986. That also flows against the prevailing winds, but uh, that turns out to be really incorrect because of uh, the Kelvin wave propagation from the Indian East Coast, as we have seen. Bruce et al. in 1994 identified a luxury high in geosite altimetry. John Bruce had been a part of the International Indian Ocean Expedition. He retired shortly after we published the next paper on this topic in 1998 <coughs> and uh, when he found that found a hint of that high and geosat ultimately geosat preceded tropics in Poseidon he went back to his hydrographic data of the International Indian Ocean Expedition and there it was now you could see it earlier it wasn't sure if there was something there or not there because the spacing of the stations the way the data were collected the way the sections were planned rather uh, they were planning to map the basin and uh, West India coastal current and so on were not critical. The boundary current that they were interested in was the Somali current. So there we would have had more systematic observations with closer stations, closely spaced stations to map the boundary current system, not of the west coast of India. <laughs> in Shankar and Shetty in 1997, they identified the Lakshadweep low in Tropex Poseidon altimetry and the annual cycle of sea level of southwest India. They related uh, that to the West India Coastal Current. <coughs> now, if, yeah. Which theory? McCreary 1986 theory is, I don't think it's written off completely yet, it still holds. There may be other things that are involved, but uh, I don't think it's completely explained yet. I haven't kept track of the ideas on that. J. McCready would be a better person to ask. Now, if you go back to another of those IAU papers, Sundar Amam and Murthy, 1968, this is again from uh, Summer Monsoon. Dynamic topography of the sea surface related to 500 decibels, June to August 1963. You can see the cyclonic circulation. So, nobody commented on these things in those days. But in hindsight, when you go back, you can reinterpret data. Now you have theories that are fairly robust. You can see that repetition of the high and low cycle in the alternative data. It's a pretty good theory. And uh, if you go back now and you look at this picture, I would call it a luxury flow. I wouldn't be hesitant to call it that. So hindsight at times can be an exact science, but it's easier to be wiser in hindsight. In 1968, I'm not sure I would have had the guts to call it that. So it's easier to look back and wonder what people did. but. You have to put yourself back in time and look at the data as it was, as it appeared at that time. And it is only then that you will appreciate what was done through this long march of history. Remote forcing. <clears throat> For the Indian Ocean, the first major paper is Potemra et al. 1991. Jim O'Brien and student again. Lisa and you et al. 1991. Remote forcing from the equator affects the East India Coastal Current. We were in competition with them. Uh, and we just about beat them to 
it later. Uh, not Potemra and you. This is a set of papers that come before my time. McCree et al. 1993. I've asked you to read that paper. I think it should be a compulsory reading for any chap who wants to do a PhD in Indian Ocean uh, Oceanography. Whether it's uh, biology or chemistry or geology or physics, it does not matter. Comprehensive numerical simulation of the dynamics of the Indian Ocean confirms importance of remote forcing for the ICC, suggests remote forcing important for WICC. Now this is a nonlinear model. In this kind of a nonlinear system, you cannot carry out the kind of uh, um, numerical experiments that were carried out in McCree et al. 1996. Shankar et al. 96 is an analytic system where you can I mean, you can cut things the way you want. All processes are dropped the moment you drop a term, drop a particular term. Whatever you want to remove, you can remove. Retain only what you want to remove, retain. But at the same time, there are certain processes that you cannot model analytically. We've seen a consequence of that. I tried to spend a lot of time, spent six months, just threw it into a bin later, using that parabolic coordinate system. No results. I don't think it's solvable. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. At least I can't do it. Adish analyzed the relative importance of EICC forcing mechanisms using a linear continuously stratified model. Now, moment you have a linear model, unlike the nonlinear model of the Creator 1993, you can split the forcing into pieces, and that's how it was done. The boundary condition was tampered with to allow only east coast winds, only the winds along the eastern boundary of the bay. There was a damper put in the equator. There's all kinds of experiments that were done to isolate each of the processes. There were four that were looked at east coast winds, eastern boundary winds, the equatorial winds, and equipment pumping in the interior of the basin. Four processes, and each of them has an impact at some time of the year along the east coast of India. Now, we were in competition with two groups, unfortunately. One was the group of uh, Jim O'Brien, and I don't know which students of his at that time, or not students, maybe colleagues of his. We just about beat them to this. Uh, my recollection is they were trying to use the conservation of potential vorticity to explain what. Uh, was happening to the East India Coastal Current and uh, built it in a different fashion. Vinay in IS, he was doing his PhD thesis. He was also looking at EICC forcing mechanisms using an OGCM. It was the first use of an OGCM for such a study of uh, physical oceanography anywhere in India. It used to be a big exercise just to put the model together and get it running. It was in the plug and play form that it is today. Today, I mean, models are like USB pen drives. You put them in. It does some auto run and everything starts happening all by itself. It wasn't like that. It was more like those vacuum tube uh, radios where you have to switch it on and you need to know some electronics to get it working. Or those old cars where you had to crank it. You actually had to meddle a lot with the code to get things done. It wasn't the plug and play system that we have today. <coughs> Remote forcing of the West India Coastal Current. McCree et al. 93 suggested that it was important. Shankar and Shetty in 97 showed that it was important. Then Shankar et al. 2002 analyzed the West India Coastal Current forcing mechanisms. McCree et al. 93 and Shankar and Shetty 97 said that the longshore pressure gradient for the West India Coastal Current is set up by coastal killing waves propagating along the east and west coast of India, not by the salinity gradient as envisaged by Shetty et al. You don't need the salinity gradient to produce the reversal in the current, to get the current going into the wind. Communication between East India Coastal Current and West India Coastal Current via the summer and winter monsoon current south of Sri Lanka makes West Coast of India different. Because you have a, an eastern boundary that is not a classical eastern boundary in that its uh, southern part doesn't extend to minus infinity, it does not cross the equator. You have a boundary which is a continuation of a western boundary. It's a, very, it's a unique geography and it's made even more remarkable by the ending of Sri Lanka at 6 north. If Sri Lanka were at 3 north, the physics would be interestingly different. Sufficiently interesting for a simulation to be carried out to check what really happens. I haven't seen the results, but I think the LCS model now is uh, easy enough to tamper with to set up such a simulation. So if you carry one out, let me know what the result is. Shetty et al. 2008, and I'll show you some pictures from that, showed the first observational evidence for remote forcing of the West India Coastal Current. Now, in 2004, we have a paper based on Armex hydrographic data, XPD data actually, the Arabian Sea Monsoon Experiment, Gopal Krishna's XPD data, and it showed westward propagation of inversions in the Lakshadweep Sea. 
very difficult that uh, very difficult to capture that feature. We were lucky. It's a wave that is going to cross the Lakshadweep Sea. It's about a degree wide in just one month. At 10, 10 centimeters per second, you calculate it. it takes a month to go across. <coughs> he was sampling fortnightly. And the fortnightly sampling, if you hit the crest and trough of a wave, you can see that. But if you are somewhere in the middle, you really won't know what's going on. It was just luck, I think, because next year he couldn't see it. He couldn't see that neat westward propagation. There was too much of fresh water. So there was an additional complication coming from thermodynamics being somewhat different. But uh, one comment that was received when the manuscript original version was rejected by Gerald was that uh, there is no distinction here between theory and observation because uh, we were talking of the coastal Kelvin wave and the associated Rossby wave as if they were obvious. And the reviewer, that reviewer pointed out that there was still no observational evidence for remote uh, posing along the west coast of India. There is no way to explain the observations without invoking remote posing. There is no way to do it. But in observations, nobody had shown, as Chelton and Davis and Enfield and Allen had shown along the eastern boundary, the Pacific, in the North American uh, coastal regime and later in the South American coastal regime that clean propagation of sea level. Nobody had shown that. So this observational evidence was to come in 2008. You can see the time it can take. It can take <coughs> almost two decades before observations can catch up with theory at times. What Shetty et al. did was to use a set of current meter data that were collected in our coastal monitoring and management program in 2003, March, April. It's just a one month long current meter record. There are five of them, two of Arambo, 10 and 20 meter water depth, two of Polva, 10 and 20 meter water depth, and one of Murmaka, 20 meter water depth. And what is shown here is the Kolwa 20 meter current meter data, and the wind data from the anemometer located on the terrace of this building. So they took that one month current meter record, split into two parts empirically one with periods greater than 10 days and the other with periods less than 10 days it turned out that for this one month record in march april 2003 if you look at the high frequency period less than 10 day wind that is in uh, blue and the high frequency current that is in red it's not bad you would tend to think that the high frequency current forces the high frequency wind. You get a pretty decent correlation between them with an average lag time, wind leading current of about 12 hours. <coughs> if you look at the low frequency part, however, the wind is unidirectional over this one month period. The current reverses direction. There is no way this wind can force this current reversal. So what was done was to look at quick scat wind data quick scat, the scatterometer. And the winds do not reverse south of Goa till Kolam and Kerala, a distance of over 600 kilometers. And we are talking here of uh, not the kind of dynamics we've been talking of till now, that is uh, continental slope and deep ocean. With the reduced gravity model, uh, we are basically talking of an infinitely deep ocean. We're talking of just an active layer, maybe um, an infinitely deep quiescent ocean below that. Remote forcing is important even in near coastal waters in depths as shallow as 10 to 20 meters. Now these are no longer Kelim waves, coastal Kelim waves, because you have topography. The Kelim wave assumes a uh, uh, vertical wall as its coast. The moment you put in topography, it is modified into what's called continental shelf waves or coastally trapped waves. There's a theory for that. And <clears throat> this was a heuristic piece of evidence in that we don't prove that this wind forcing can produce that current reversal. We are only saying that we are seeing a reversal in the current and no reversal in the wind. And these are reasonably authentic data. They are from an anemometer measuring at, uh, measuring every 10 minutes. The And they have been shown earlier to match what you see in the quick scat winds. That was done by Parma. So this paper basically shows that you cannot explain the reversal in the current by the local wind. And the only place from which you can get remote forcing is from the south because 
whether it's a killing wave or a shelf of possibly tractors, they're going to propagate at periods greater than the initial period with a post on their right. It's only the gravity waves that can go both ways. At frequencies higher than the initial frequency, things are different. But we are talking about frequencies less than the initial frequency. Periods greater than the initial period. So the only way the wave can propagate is from south to north along the west coast of India. So we track down south. And it's only till only at Kolam of Kerala that we first hit the reversal in the wind. So at least you have to go as far south as Kolam in Kerala. The trouble was when we looked at data later from 2009 or 10, March, April, 2008 is another set of measurements. We had a problem. I carried out the same exercise. One of the project assistants was doing that, and I thought he wasn't doing it right because the 10 day thing didn't give any correlation for the high frequency. To make matters worse, the low frequency correlated, the high frequency was completely uncorrelated. We kept changing the cutoff. The result remained the same. The high frequency was completely uncorrelated to the low wind. It was only the low frequency that was correlating. This was a puzzle, and that puzzle was unexplained until Amon looked at the ADCP data, which were for a longer period. And these ADCPs were on the 100 meter contour and the 1100 meter contours. So one is on the continental slope and the other is on the practically the shelf edge. You can see that this is the topography. 100 meter contour and 200 meter contour are pretty close. They are not far apart on the west coast of India. So 100 meters is as good as shelf break. And uh, <coughs> this was a six month ADCP record. And what we found is that on the shelf, you get a lot of four day waves propagating along the coast. This meant that in the 2003 record, we were just lucky that we were looking at one period when the locally forced wind didn't have a four day period. Sorry, the remotely forced four day period wasn't there. The entire uh, four day thing was coming locally, or almost entirely. And the remotely forced four day part was probably extremely weak. That's why that four day thing went to four to five day cycle went into the high frequency locally forced part and the rest of it again quite lucky for us the current reversed the wind did not so it was very neat it uh, went into the local plus remotely forced part now in 2008 that was not the case you see four day waves propagating along the west coast of india on the shelf and uh, even on the slope to some extent not as many propagations could be tracked on the slope as on the shelf but they are there so it implies that uh, even if you're looking at very rapid changes, and this is important if you're doing environmental impact assessments, you want to look at the impact of an effluent pipeline of the coast of work. You don't have a choice. The winds of Kolam can cause a reversal in the current. And these are things that have to be factored in. And these currents, <coughs> as you can see, are not weak. These are of the order of 10 to 20 centimeters per second. I mean, you add up this uh, 7, 8 centimeters per second to this 10 centimeters, you're talking of something like 17 centimeters per second. These are not weak currents. So these are uh, important. And they're important for sediment transport along the coast. So they're important for what happens to the coastline. <coughs> Which means that the kind of theories we've been talking of, they get more complicated when you come onto the shelf because now you have a topography. What we did earlier was to separate the Z dependence. We said we had a function psi n of Z. We had a function of X, Y, and T multiplying a function of z. When you come onto the shelf, z and t z and x, if x is cross shoot, can no longer be separated. So you have a function of y and t multiplying a function of uh, x and z. So you end up having to solve a two-point boundary value problem in x and z. You have, otherwise you have a, sorry, a two-point boundary value problem in z coupled to a two-point boundary value problem in x, if you're looking at the shelf. In the Cases that we have looked at, where we looked at the LCS system, we had a two-point boundary value problem in the inset. We had a rigid lid at the surface and we had the ocean bottom at, say, 4,000 meters. So we were fixing W to zero at uh, both places and we were solving that problem and we got the mode shapes. Now you will get mode shapes, but they will be functions of both X and Z. So you get contours. I mean, look at the 2012 paper by Amol et al. 
it's uh, the first application of coastally tract wave theory to this region and uh, it's not that it's the first time somebody tried applying it Shetty had got these uh, codes that were finally used in the early 90s after he did some sea level data he wanted to test these out because the theories were developed <coughs> partly in uh, America where the University of Oregon and the University of Washington had contributed quite a bit. They studied a lot of the shelf wave propagation along the west coast of the United States. The other one was on the coast of Australia. That's a remarkable coastline. You can have a wave going all the way around Australia. It's, uh, and it's temperate on one end, the south. You have cities like Melbourne, which are which freeze in winter, and you have Darwin in the north, which is tropics, it's pretty close to the equator. It's a remarkable continent, and you can have waves just going all the way around the Australian coast. So these were the two places where coastal track waves had been studied. He tried applying it, but he didn't have enough data. Even if he had run the models, if he had come up with some solutions, there was nothing useful to compare with. I got those codes in 2000, maybe late 90s, 2000 around that. Again, there was no point. There were no observations on which we could test these things. It was only in 2006 when the ADCP measurement started. In 2008, we had put three ADCPs, one each of Bhatkal, Goa, and uh, three pairs of ADCPs, one each of Bhatkal, Goa, and Jagat, that's near Atnagiri, that uh, we had sufficient data, six month data record from the shelf over three places separated by about 200 kilometers and uh, 200 and 200 kilometers that the theory could finally be tested and it showed that not only do you have to go to column remote forcing is probably coming in from even farther south the trouble is when you go equatorward when you go down south along the off the west coast of India along the 1000 or 200 meter isobath. The 200 meter isobath is something that uh, it does bend into the Gulf of Banar. But if you want to look at the papers on the East India Coastal Current and West India Coastal Current, in particular look at Durand et al. 2009 for the East India Coastal Current, there is one altimeter section that goes in through the Gulf of Banar. You will see that the peak current, unlike at the other sections along the east coast of India, in all the other sections, the peak current lies on the point closest to the coast. Not in this section. It is away from the coast. It is where you would draw an imaginary line connecting the southern tip of India smoothly with the southern tip of Sri Lanka. So that calendar that comes down, it just... It's too small a scale for this long calendar to even see it. It just goes up. And this is something that had been shown earlier. You have coastlines that have bumps. What happens to these waves? It was shown that if the wavelength is much longer than the length scale of these bumps, the wave just, just doesn't care, it just goes through. These bumps may not as the just uh, need not exist, doesn't care for them. The Gulf of Manu But when I'm looking at shelf waves, I can't do anything. I have to go along the shelf. So now I have to go into the Gulf of Manar and bend around towards Colombo and then I have to bend towards Tinkovali. Because when you have a wind burst on the southern tip of India and Sri Lanka, and the Gulf of Manar is a regime where you have a channeling of the winds between the almost collapsed eastern ghats and the hills in the central part of Sri Lanka, you have strong winds blowing there. You have one side, one sign on the Tutikorin coast, and an opposite sign, the opposite sign on the Colombo coast. They are blowing uh, from uh, southwest to northeast, but on Tutikorin, it's an east, it's a western boundary. In Colombo, it's an eastern boundary. We have a completely different signal. In one case, it's upwelling, in the other case, it's downwelling. Both will create shell waves. What happens? We still don't have answers, and these are things that we need to look at, because shelf particle uh, oceanography has just begun, and it's important for looking at uh, implications of physics for biogeochemistry. Maybe even climate. Not as sure of that, but I think it has implications. Maybe before I retire, we'll know that. Either way. So, summary 
The Northern Ocean is different. It is small in comparison to the other basins. It has a time dependent wind forcing. The seasonal reversing circulation is the dominant one. The mean circulation is much weaker in the seasonal cycle, unlike in other basins. So the steady state theories of Swedrup, Stommel, and Monk are not valid. It's a tropical basin, which implies it's closer to the equator, and therefore large-scale planetary waves propagate faster across the basin. This was the key point of Lytle's 1969 paper. The results of uh, studies uh, done in the 90s and early 2000s show that most of the observed seasonal cycle of surface circulation is explicable by linear wave theory. I've italicized, I emphasize seasonal because we still don't know what happens at interseasonal time scales. How important is nonlinearity? We do not know. I think we're just beginning to start testing those ideas. And it's going to maybe take another decade before we are able to make some statement uh, that is clean. The last comment I have is uh, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, it does not matter. Remote forcing is important. Whether you believe in them or not, cross waves exist. Thermocline goes up and down. There is a seasonal cycle. There is interseasonal variability in the thermocline that may not propagate, cannot propagate, depending on the latitude. And uh, I don't see how you can do any serious biogeochemistry or climate studies if you don't know this kind of question. But you could just learn how to run a GCM, you can get a PhD. At the end of the day, you will have papers, but you will not know what has gone into them. And that was the reason for this course, to break it into simple digestible bits. It is not that adding these bits is going to produce the complete solution, but it is going to give you insights into pieces. These pieces may interact non-linearly at times. The addition of these pieces is not necessarily going to be the whole. You have to remember that. But in the Indian Ocean, at least the North Indian Ocean in which our uh, interest lies for us up now, except for those Somali gyres, linear systems are pretty good. In fact, there is a recent paper, it's just come in press, you will see it on the NIO website also, on the main web page, the Yanai waves, um, paper of Chatterjee et al. It looks at linear forcing, that is by direct waves, we have looked at that, tau y forcing of Yanai waves. It also looks at uh, an idea that was proposed way back in 1989. In 1989, John Kendall and uh, Thompson, Dana Thompson, from uh, O'Brien's group, they ran a reduced gravity model with monthly mean winds, but they had saved the response at higher frequency, higher uh, uh, time resolution. And when they looked at the equatorial response, they could see some Yanai wave signatures. So they said that it's the nonlinearity associated with the eddy field of Somalia that is generating these Yanai waves. Apart from those great two eddies, Great Wall and the Sopatra eddy. There is one more that straddles the equator, it's called the Southern Gyre, and it migrates northward during the season. In this paper, we showed how that gyre could generate an So, 14 years after, 14, 24 years, quarter of a century after the idea was first uh, suggested, it was speculation which couldn't be proved and nobody bothered to look at it in detail. And it turned out, turns out that it is true, but uh, there's also strong forcing coming from uh, Tau Y field. There's one more thing that happens. You have a Tau Y field or even a Tau X field. You have a slanted coastline of uh, the west coast of Africa, east coast of Africa. And that slanting, if it's at 45 degrees, can produce anti that's another fact. All solutions we've been talking of so far have been with very clean zonal and meridional boundaries. Coastlines tend to be complicated. They probably have applications. And I guess the work to be done over the next uh, decade or so will start unraveling. And maybe we will have uh, an easier way to talk to biogeochemists, at least those who are interested in listening to physical oceanographers. Now this is a, it's not just a thank you picture, 
it is actually a tribute to a lot of things. I couldn't have done any of what I have uh, done without free software. I can't afford to buy software. I don't have that kind of money and I had even less money earlier. So this is you no know, tribute to Richard Stallman. This is the Linux Penguin, tribute to Linux Torvalds, thanks to whom I have an operating system, a kernel and an operating system and software that I can afford to download and redistribute. There is, um, of course, the ship, very important. Without the ship, there's no oceanography, at least to me. There is, uh, uh, this is an Argo float. So you have instruments like radio sounds in the ocean these days. You have satellites. When I came here, I saw for the first time what you people will never even appreciate, 12 transparencies, global images in which the Indian Ocean practically disappears. The Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal are almost not seen. In that, there is this small pitch, small feature called the Lakshadweep High and an even smaller one called the Lakshadweep Glow, predating of the west coast of India. That is uh, the kind of images we were used to. No, it came from France. Somebody gave it to him. Lepro, who is one of the gurus of tidal modeling. Uh, moorings. This is an actual picture that I happened to click on a mooring cruise in the Arabian Sea. Uh, very lucky to catch this buoy as it uh, drops into the sea. They have, to me, revolutionized the way we look at uh, this region. If it was not for these moorings, 20 years after Shetty first got those uh, coastally trapped wave theory, CTW theory codes, even today we would not have been in a position to do anything with them. And they can be wrong, but what will you do with theory if you don't have any sensible data to compare? Uh, there are big computers today. You need them. In fact, uh, some of you are doing uh, assignments on machines that are big much bigger than ones that I have ever used. But this whole course has been with these kind of things, simple lines drawn on paper. This is still required, but they go together, just as uh, automated instrumentation, whether it is drifting or moored, ships and satellites, all play a role. So, I think it's a remarkable time. You can do things that uh, we couldn't have even dreamt of uh, doing in 10 years back. There's more money now. Even with the recession, we have more money than we ever had in our careers. <clears throat> you probably get more money in one year in projects now than Shetty did for most of his research career. But, uh, the reason this course is taught the way it is, is because without this part, the rest is meaningless. It is this that allows you to squeeze more out of a small budget. And you'll always have this issue because the rupee is still over 50 to a dollar. Your competition is not restricted to the corridors of NIO or within the confines of the Indian um, mainland or Indian territory, it is global. If you have a one lakh, uh, one crore budget and somebody has a one crore dollar budget, that's two very different things. Machines cost the same, whether you buy it in the US or here. So this is something you cannot let go of. But uh, much of your career will be spent with machines of this kind. So if you keep your feet here and have your fingers on those fancy keyboards, I think you'll go a long way. But uh, even if you are dabbling here, remember that this is still there. Don't forget that. Observation and theory, they go together. The score started with observations. We have ended with uh, explaining 
at least in some fashion. The theory that we did, we have tried looking at which piece can explain what. We have not yet gone to the extent of showing, yes, this Bitki jet is the Yoshida jet. That's a different business altogether. We are not doing that. But yes, the theory matches. You see that jet and you see its uh, extension eastward and westward. And that is exactly what the solution should be. So that is what we have. Uh, before I end, I have one more thing to do. And that is uh, to thank the person without whom this course would not have been possible. If it was not for the effort put in by Arnab, I don't think this course would have had the value it is likely to have. I hope people who have not been listening live will still be able to make use of it. Some are, and maybe it will be useful long after they are given. I hope to improve on these lectures next year. But anyway, thanks a lot. Without the uh, amount of effort you put in, this would not have worked. Uh, to put things in perspective, in October, September, October, when Jay McCreary was here, September, October 2012, we could not beam his lectures because uh, the communication links here were too slow. Today, they are fast enough for those animations to be beamed live. It's not that they are playing the animations on a machine there and looking at uh, that screen and trying to imagine where my cursor is. I can move my cursor here and point out two features and they are seeing it live. Things have changed in five months. We couldn't have done this uh, even in September 2012. So McCready was happy to know that this course has gone the way it is. And of course, a great tribute to Jay McCready. Mm, I think the only tribute I can pay is to propagate his lecture notes, which is the best set I've seen. If uh, any of you is interested and would like to pay back to him what is due to a great teacher, my suggestion would be to enter them into LaTeX. Those notes are difficult to read, but if you enter them into LaTeX, please make sure that errors are eliminated. Check the calculations, solve everything, confirm, then put it into LaTeX. And it would be great to have all those lecture notes as a set of PDF files, if not handwritten, though it has its own uh, merit, but in, uh, very different form, printed form. Anyway, thanks a lot. And no more questions, right? We'll call it a day.